Good uh, afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the seminar, which is uh, financed by Nyampa and uh, is co sponsored by the Italian chapter of the Country Sister Society. And it's the first seminar of a series of seminars that go under one initiative that we call the Road to, to CDC. Well, thank you. And, uh, what is Rotto CDC? You know, next year CDC will be in uh, Milano. And so we are trying to attract people to CDC. And so all these seminars will start with a presentation reminding you that next year the CDC will be in Milano. And uh, there is uh, one initiative which is very important uh, for your students. This is uh, a prize, an award for uh, master student thesis. So if you have uh, students uh, doing a master, they can uh, present their thesis, uh, record a very small uh, video, 10, 10, uh, three minutes, how much is that? 10, ten minutes, and uh, three minutes, three minutes video, so a very short video, and present the thesis, and the best 10 thesis uh, will uh, get a free subscription uh, to CDC, the free registration to CDC. And actually, there is another initiative which is pins and t shirts, but uh, they are, this is the first one, uh, and the t shirts are not ready yet. So I was supposed to give you t shirts, they will be next time. If, uh, if you want, uh, uh, come to me and I will. Okay. And this first uh, seminar is uh, by Costantino Lagoa, which is I'm not going to present to him, and you know him very well. He's a friend of us, has been in uh, many times. And the talk he's going to present today is uh, a talk which is perfect for uh, the Nyampa seminar series. So, a talk uh, with math content, and it's called The Simultaneous Learning of Fitting Surface in oh. Noise Distribution from Large Data Sets. So, thank you, Constantina. I'm very happy to have you here again. And thank you, Fabrizio, and thank you for uh, inviting me here. Uh, it's, always, uh, oops, it's always a pleasure to come back to Torino. And uh, so, what I'm going to talk about in here is some math that doesn't have a lot, but it has a little bit of math in it. And it's more like the, the exploration of a few ideas we've been playing with to do surface fitting and I will talk a little bit why we are interested in this and a few preliminary results that we had and a few discussion points. So, a few facts. So, the, this work in here started a while ago with the, <laughs> when it was a while ago. Before the pandemic, somewhere, that's where we measure things right now. Uh, with some work with Fabrizio and um, my former student, Sara, and uh, Omar, my PhD student right now, has been playing a little bit with it. And, and I would like to thank also the funding agencies that have been funding my work, so the National Institutes of Health and the, the National Science Foundation. So, um, the problem can be put in a, so we'll go into the mathematical, to some of the assumptions we're going to make in, in this, but the, the problem itself is rather simply stated, statable. Uh, you go in there, you have a bunch of points, you know these points are corrupted by noise, and we want to find the surface that goes in between the true points, obviously not ones corrupted by noise. And that's the overall thing we want to do. We have a bunch of this, uh, usually in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of points, corrupted perhaps by large amounts of noise. And we'd like to see, at least in some circumstances, if we can actually recuperate the original surface. So why, being a control person, why did I get interested in this? First of all, uh, we want to, to just in general, like simp uh, simple uh, 
descriptions, lower dimensional descriptions of the data uh, so that you can extrapolate, you can take the data that you have and in a more or less safe way, extrapolate the, the information that these points give to you. Also, and this was actually the first problem when I started working on this, and uh, you want to identify things, of, whoops, sorry. Things of the form y of k is equal to some g of y k minus y. And so this is identifying systems. This is no more than putting a surface on the regressor y k, y k minus one in the, this surface. So y k minus g of y k minus one has to be equal to zero. You are fitting a surface to your data. And so we, this can even go to actually when we did this, we did for switch systems where your surface is actually a union of surfaces. And if you do this, you can also put it in this way where you have a multiplication of a bunch of things. One of them should be zero. So switch systems do this, nonlinear systems. So if you can do this efficiently, not only can you play with the pictures that I'm going to see later on, you should be able to do uh, identification of nonlinear systems or linear systems is a particular case, but nonlinear systems also by trying to fit uh, surfaces to the noisy data that you've collected about that system. So, there, um, there are a bunch of uh, approaches out there. If you go to the literature on uh, on surface special on surface estimation, especially on if you go to journals on machine learning, you see a bunch of things in there. Some try to make the, the approximation as y equals gx. The problem with this, you cannot do those unions of surface. You cannot know any surface where the, the a line intersects in two points at least. And then we have the ones that we're going to talk about in here, which is to explain your surface by being the zero set of a, of a function, which is the one that allows you also to have this union of surfaces like we've done before, like I've seen in the picture before. So this is going well. I don't know if I'll take the whole hour. But... And so interrupt me in the middle if you have questions. So there's some of the previous words. So there are linear fitting methods. There are all the, the things where you just fit a linear function or as you are go going to do here, ours is more or less in the linear fitting methods where you have a linear combination of elements and phases. That is all of the words where they try to, among other things, try to uh, have this, your g of x equal, that you want to make equal to zero having this in their um, cost function that allows to do some uh, surface smoothing at all time, but tends to be really computational expensive. And then we are being recorded, right? So I have to be careful if I'm going to say next. Then you have several basic um, uh, deep learning methods to do this. We have to be careful with the deep learning methods because sometimes they are, they are trying to solve something that is actually for actually you don't need a neural network to solve it. But they, the, the claim in here, at least in the papers I've seen, is that you become more robust with respect to noise. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of that in the experiments that we've done. But anyway, I'm not going to dwell a lot on this. So, we are going to forget about that we can do linear systems, uh, sorry, the dynamical systems in here. We're going to concentrate just on, we have a surface, in this case a foot, and we want to describe the boundary of this by the zero set, of a function. Um, we are assuming that we do not know the, the true data. Um, the true data is contaminated by 
uh, noise that I'm assuming for the sake of this presentation to be IID, it doesn't have to be IID, there can be uh, dependence, and that happens a lot in dynamic systems, but I know that for the, for the time being, we're going to assume it's IID. I know the distribution, but I don't know the distribution exactly. I know the distribution up until certain parameters. For example, we have a uniform, so you know um, a priori you have a uniform, but you don't know the path in the uniform, for example. So, for the noiseless case, noiseless case, so if you have access to your uh, X size exactly, uh, and this is the problem, can be put as a rather simple quadratic optimization problem, which has a, actually has a fixed solution. In the case, you assume that your function G can be expressed as a linear combination of elements in some places. So you go in here, you have your G as being a transpose times the elements of the basis. You go, you multiply B by B transpose. You sum all of this over all the data points that you have. You want to meet this equation. That's it. But the main, one of the things in here is that when you make it in this formulation, the size of the matrix L is independent of how many points you have. It's just the number of parameters that you're looking for. And uh, so the if you think now in terms of computation, this guy in here doesn't really matter if you have a lot of points. Actually, the more points, because you can do better approximations. But by the end, you have a matrix in here that is just n by n, where n is the number of uh, elements, or I think I use L. L by L, well, well L is the number of elements in your basis, and that's it. No, actually, no L is the number of points. I need for you. Yeah. <laughs> so it belongs to the null no space of this, and this is the whole point. And so what you're doing essentially when you're doing fitting is minimizing this quadratic function subject to the uh, magnitude of A equals to one. There are many solutions, obviously. Um, and you can solve this easily. Just compute the matrix L, compute the minimum singular value, or in the case where you're not approximating, you have the exact data, the minimum singular value is zero. And you compute the eigenvector uh, associated with the eigenvalue zero. You're done. Small matrix compared to data points and it's it. Now, what happens if you have this? So what I'm doing in here is a few stupid calculations that you can do when you have one. So recall, I know the distribution of my noise up until a few parameters. So for the time being, let's just assume you know the distribution of the noise. And uh, you know that if uh, our basis is 1x, so we're trying to fit the surface to a linear surface. When you multiply these guys, you have x's, x squares, and all that stuff. So you'd like to know what happens, oops, wrong direction. What happens to these guys is um, you put noise on them. So what you would like to do is you cannot use the, the, the y points directly because they have noise. You should be able to take to do something to the calculate to the your matrix that essentially denoises it. And so what you have is that the expected value of y is just x plus the expected value of the noise, which I call m1, moment one of the noise. This shouldn't be called, well, this is called moment two, okay. Uh, if you do a little bit more calculations, you see if you had estimated already of y, you can estimate e of y squared as a function or x1 squared as a function of the expected value of y squared. And you can keep on this. You get a bunch of terms in here that have to do with the moments of your noise. And then that's it. So you can keep on doing this. And essentially, you denoise your matrix. So you go in here. And everywhere you have y x squared in your matrix, you put e of y squared minus all of this junk. 
And you essentially denoise your matrix. If you can compute E of one square, then E of one. This works not only, I mean, I don't have the closed formula in here. This works for any power of one. Essentially, all powers of X are the invertible transformation of the moments of one. Assuming you know the moments of moments. So, I could go and stop my presentation here saying I'm done. This is the thing. What characteristics, I mean, we would like to use other bases. Monomial bases are uh, notorious, they ill behaved in numerical terms. So you might want to use other bases. Um, the essential here are the characteristics of the bases that for which this approach will work. All of the examples I'm going to do is with monomial bases, but these are the, the characteristics of the bases that we are um, that we are using. We have an ordered basis where we have elements of order zero, elements of order one, elements of order two, and so on. If you take elements of order i and j and multiply them, you get a, an element of order i plus j. And this is the thing that we are exploiting a lot to be in the, our computation, because essentially, if you take expectation on this side, this is deterministic, we get expectation here. And this allows you to separate noise from the so this is the thing that we that we exploit a lot. Uh, there are a few other small uh, additional things that we'd like to do to our bases. But if this is done in the right way, what you can do, you can go to bases of order zero, do the denoising, then go to bases of order one, use the result on bases of order zero, do the denoising, and you can keep on doing this because of these two properties here. And monomials are the ones that we started with. They immediately do this. Uh, we have um, a couple of others that we've tried that also work for this. Products of exponentials and monomials and products of uh, uh, exponential and sines and cosines, which is the same thing as products with exponentials. The properties are the same. So what, have, um, what can we, we say is that right now we can take the matrix that uh, we would like to compute the eigenfactor associated with the zero eigenvalue, which this is the matrix that uh, uh, whose null space gives you the coefficients of the expansion that feeds the data that you have. In and I can have an M hat of y and the parameters of the noise, because moments that we've seen before in here, I assumed in here that my moments weren't fixed, but the, the, the things that I'd like actually to do is having this as a function of a parameter I can search of. And you can have this, the, this essentially uh, having, um, uh, this as a function of the uh, expected values of the basis functions of, uh, uh, for each one, evaluated at each one. So we have all of this. And uh, so we can go and say, okay, I sh given that I only have noisy data, I want to work with this guy on this. We obviously don't have the moments of y, we don't have the expected value of the basis evaluated at y. You do the usual thing. You this is where you leverage the fact that you have lots of data. You can go and just use the strong law of large numbers. And um, uh, under the, the, the assumption that the, the variance of your basis function is finite and uniformly bounded. You can use the Kolmogorov's law, uh, strong law of large numbers, and say that the difference between averaging and the true matrix goes to zero almost surely. Actually, you know the rate, 
the rate is one over J uh, for the um, uh, without many assumptions on the noise. If your noise is bounded and your data is bounded, this probability is actually goes exponentially. So this more or less works. So what do we do this? Then in practical, in a practical case, what you do, you just compute this guy on this side, you compute this minimum singular value, and you use that as an approximation of the true minimum singular value, should be a small number, and uh, you then um, compute the associated eigenvector or singular vector, and uh, that will give you the estimate of the parameters. Um, you do this as a function of theta, or you search over theta. We assume that we had just a couple of parameters for which we can do this nonlinear search on, um, and uh, you try to figure out what is the right place. And so, what is the right place? Um, so I already talked, talked about the first few things there. So the right thing is for estimating theta, then there is a very simple algorithm for this. You take your uh, uh, ML in here, this, this guy in here. Oops. So you take this guy, which you know in close form. Um, you put the y in there, you do the average, and for each value of data, you compute signal mean. This guy as a function of theta. And then, what will be the best one? The best one will be the one that gives you the smallest, smallest minimum singular value. And so, in this way, you can estimate. Um, not only the parameters, you can estimate the parameters of the noise also because the parameters of the noise are what, the ones that are going to make our sigma mean as small as possible. So as I said, the, if the, uh, everything is bounded, then convergence is exponential. If um, so the dependence on M, this comes, uh, is just uh, more dependence on the basis, uh, on the expected uh, values of the basis that taps, and this just comes from the fact that multiplication of two bases gives also one element of the basis. So the, all of those things are in work. So it's very easy to test in advance if you satisfy the, the uh, properties, the, the, the assumptions on the strong law of large numbers. And uh, what did that the IID function can be relaxed. I mean, this is really, I mean, if, for this talk, this is not terribly important. If you're dealing with systems, it's very, very important. And this is very, very important because your YK depends on YK minus one, YK minus one depends on YK minus two. So we can no longer assume that Ys are um, independent. And so if the y's are not independent, well, let me put it in another way. If you have observation noise, and the y's are independent, because the only, the, the only thing that happens that goes into uh, the only stochastic things that you go is just on the measurement side. If your noise emphasis process noise, if it is an input system, then they are dependent. You can get results if your system is uh, exponentially stable, for example. There are separation as you go very far away from yk to yk plus t, and your strong uh, there is there are large large numbers that work for this. But uh, IID is much easier to work with and to explain what's going on. But just take into account that if you go back to the to the example that we had, where um, when we have a linear system or a switch linear system, as I presented, you need to be careful with the assumptions that you make on your noise and on the system itself, because if the system itself is not exponentially stable, things start to be a little bit hairy in terms of convergence of these summations that I'm going to do here. So here is the first example. 
We worked a little, quite a bit on this example because there is a very small hole there in the, the union of the two cones. And we wanted to make sure when we did the identification, we get it back. Because you put those, that hole is really small. And once you put noise, if you plot the noisy data, the, that hole disappears. You take any any surface um, estimation algorithm in the literature, no one, I, the ones that we tried at least, identified that small hole that is there in the noise. This is a second order. Uh, this is uh, the zero set of a second order polynomial in X and Y in Z. Um, so this is the, the search that I was telling you about. This, uh, uh, this plot uh, on the left. This is a plot of the minimum singular value as a function of the parameter of the noise. In this case, it's uniform, so it's the percentage of the noise, which this means your noise is 0.5 from minus, so minus 0.25 to 0.25, and your data is between minus one and So you go there, you plot singular value as a, as a, a function of the support of your noise. One parameter here, we are assuming noise is symmetric. And you can see this guy hits the minimum here. So it says 20% of noise, and obviously we've done this to match our thing. If this was done, then you got 20% of noise in your data. In here on the side, we have, let me zoom. In here on the side, we have a little bit on the convergence for different values uh, of noise. And this is the, since uh, the, you don't have a unique solution, the solution is anything in the null space of the matrix, we computed angles. So your angle, the cosine of, or I'm plotting the cosine of the angle, so the cosine should be zero if we get the right parameter. I'm sorry, it should be one if we get the right parameter. So you have the plot in there, 0% noise. This is a rather, it's already a quadratic surface. You try to fit a quadratic polynomial, you put 10 points in there, you can do something. It's no big deal. The most interesting thing is when you start putting noise. So if you put 20% noise, you have to have uh, hundreds of points. For this example, if you have 50% noise, you essentially you have just the clouds of things. If you plot it, it's hard to, to see. But if you start going to hundreds of thousands of points, the thing gets your surface back. Okay. So another example full of holes that we are playing with is this guy in here, which is called the Klebsch cube. This is uh, p -p -p third order polynomial, zero set of a third order polynomial. And uh, the same thing in here. Right now, this is slightly more complex. You get a little bit of a weirder behavior of the um, minimum single value. We still hit the minimum single value. If you search for it, the minimum function, the, the place where you get the minimum is the, the first. So let me go and do the, talk about this. If your noise is really large, so if you go in here to 100% of noise, you'll see another zero single value because essentially you're just explaining everything by noise. In our stuff, what we've seen, the first point that hits the minimum is the one that works. And usually it has that shape that you can have in that. It starts at a really somehow large value. Value. In the first one, the first local minimum usually is the, is the true value of the noise. And we have on this side again, let me zoom. On this side again, you have the things in here that the, as expected, if you have no noise, you can estimate the parameters really well, really quickly. If you have 50% noise, then you have to go again to the hundreds of thousands of points where the Essentially, the law of large number works well enough to get over the, the, the big margin of this. Okay, 
It jumps very fast when you make it still. Yeah, I mean, the, it might have to do with the way cosine of the angles of the fins work. I, I, that thing we don't understand why. So. And even this thing in here, we don't, this minimum in here, I don't know what happened in, in, in here. Some of this is just numerics. You're taking a bunch of points, you're summing, you're doing averages, and um, at the same time, you have to rely, we just relied on uh, the usual, the default algorithms for computing minimum single values of MATLAB, which we know that you see one, they go crazy. So this is just like using plain MATLAB without actually optimizing anything. So I, I would expect, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, if I understood correctly, you are assuming that your data generation mechanism, the actual one, is perfectly captured by your basis. Is that true? I mean, that the basis is okay, a little bit about what happens if it's not. Okay. And so it will be all experimental. These two examples, yes, completely. So that's why the cosine goes to yeah. one, because the, the, we know that with this basis, we can truly explain what's going on. And then obviously this is an approximation, but if you didn't work in here, you might as well forget that. So what happens if he was looking at the next slide, right? That I have in my talk. Yeah. So what happens if the data is not explained by the basis? So the only thing we're doing is minimize uh if we use our algorithm, minimize, and I should have put that norm of A equals to one just to have just one solution, but to minimize over A, the A transpose times P of XI, and the, so this guy is uh, norm equals to one. So sometimes it works well, or more or less well. So this would be fourth order polynomial, best approximation of butterfly by fourth order polynomial. No noise. This is what you get for the clock. So it does give you the best one. But now it's a question of starting to think about what is the best approximation of a surface. Because our only our only criterion in here is that my pen stopped working, okay. The only criterion in here is just that we minimize this quadratic function and that's it. And so if that is your criterion, this is what you get. So I, now I want to go into heuristic side and talk a little bit about what people have been doing, some people have been doing to try to get things that are more, uh, that look better. Let's put it this way. And so right now, as you go to surfaces that do not match your assumptions, then you are in this field where, okay, so if they are not this, so the minimizing the quadratic function or this quadratic function is not the best way to approximate your function, what should that best way be? What should you put in the objective criterion in there that will make things a little bit more uh, Pleasant to the eye, and so this is where it's. Uh, so this is a paper by Blaine and all, where um, what they try to do in here. So what we have in the other surfaces is that the surfaces uh, tend to jump really fast if you just change the instead of being equal to zero, you make it equal to plus epsilon b jump a lot, and that's why you see all of these curves going all, all over the place. So, uh, Blaine and all in this paper in the transactions on uh, uh, PEMI, right? Yeah, the transactions on permanent uh, pattern analysis and machine intelligence, they try to come up with a measure that will say at least close to our surface that we're trying to identify, things don't change very rapidly. And so they, they come up with this Euclidean perturbation of the things. That is actually not easy to compute because what they are trying to do in here is that for the three surfaces in here, the true surface, the one above and the one below, they don't intersect. 
So that's why they use this uh, Euclidean distance. And they are trying to make your function zero, sorry, zero on the true surface, plus C in here, minus C below, so that things are changing. At least if you perturb a little bit, you get more or less the same shape. We cannot implement this with noisy data, forget about this. Because doing if this works well if your data is noiseless. Uh, we cannot do this with noisy data. So again, this is the guy who used neural networks that I was talking about before. Um, what they what they do is just say, well, I'm going to perturb my points a little bit, and the function is just perturbed by a little bit. It's like trying to make your function smooth. So these C's that you have in there going around are usually 0.01 to 0.05, just small perturbations. So, the, so you can go to all points and try to minimize this quadratic function. In this paper, they did this minimization by putting two neural networks in series, but this is just a quadratic problem. You can go in here, and so the, here is the formulation of the quadratic as a quadratic problem. And uh, I always rely on my pen to do this, but my pen is not working. Oh, maybe now it is. Okay. So these matrices that you see in here are very similar to the matrices where we had before, just with perturb perturbed data. And a few other things that have to do with the fact that I have one a day, not the whole thing. So you have like one more row, one more column, but the structure is the same. And so the point right now is the structure is the same. So you can do all the junk that we've done before to denoise this data. So I'm not aiming in this part that actually go and work with zero data, zero noise data and say I have a better algorithm for this. Our objective in here is just whatever stupid algorithm that is out there, we make another stupid algorithm that takes noise into account. So the smoothing approach, so the, as I would say, matrix M0 is essential. So the matrix M0 that we see here in the middle is essential, in the, it's exactly the same one as before, oops, it's exactly the same one as before with uh, another row in the column of zeros. The other two are another row in columns that are just copies of the rows and columns of the matrix multiplied by the constant C. And so all the things that we've done before to try to minimize this, uh, uh, to try to clean the data, try to minimize the variance of the data with respect to the noise, we can apply to this, they have exactly the same structure. And uh, the question is, does this work? And so what this does is the following. So this is the approximation of the, that we've seen before of butterfly with um, no noise. These lines are really fake just because those, those black lines, just because there are many points there and when math, math lab plots it, it makes sense. Uh, we got this. So this is the solution to the quadratic problem as you have no noise. Again, with the heuristic perturbation by plus C, minus C, and uh, we had this thing small. So we would like to, to, to see what happens as you start increasing noise. So as you increase noise, so this is 10% noise, and we got essentially the same thing back by doing our cleaning. This is 20% and this is 30% noise. So essentially, I mean, there are small perturbations, but it looks we do this. Essentially, Things didn't change with noise. And there aren't many points. I forgot exactly the same number of points that are in here. It's somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000 points. If you start sampling more in a two dimensional space, you start having things on top of each other. It doesn't work that way. But essentially, you have a blurb in here. If you, I forgot to put the picture in there, but I can get it if you want it. If you use the algorithm that didn't do the noise, in here you have a uh, just a box. 
that's what you will get back. And we, my student wants to publish this in a, in a place other than control journals. So what you do in those places, you show lots of pictures and lots of numerical results. So I'm going to show a few more and where one where it does not work. This is the book that is used a lot. Uh, again, 10, 20, 30. When you go to 30, you go to this region in here where you have this line and this line intersecting. It's very hard to see in which side they are. That's why you see the split in there. But essentially, if you if you look at the shape, it has not changed much. So you can go up and you can see the shape is essentially the same. So the denies between the words. And uh, I'm almost done. And this is so I, I'm going through a bunch of standard pictures that would be useful um, uh, to explain the. Um, uh, to present the results in, in this stuff. The heart, you see the heart when we didn't do these perturbations plus and then we had this very weird. So if you do this smoothing, if you have 0% noise, you actually get something that is close to it. You are putting as one of your uh, objectives, your function being smooth. And uh, so this is what happens as you go. You put a lot of money. By the way, I used in all of this C equals to 0 0.04. Well, Omar put 0 0.04. And again, it's not it doesn't completely uh, recover the, the figure, but oops, if if you know you, you see that the shape doesn't change much as you put noise. So the main point in here is if you do denoising in the right way, then you can use your, for this type of algorithms, you can use your algorithms that you've done for the noiseless case and then denoise it in a more or less um, systematic or in a systematic way. And this is the airplane. Still can get it if you put 10% noise. What happens if you put 20%? This thing starts back confused with one of the images. Yeah. But again, much more stable if you if you don't use, I should have put those pictures in there, but if you don't use this denoising that we've done, these figures are all over the place. Except for the heart. For some way, the heart works really well. Okay. Oh. Actually, I do have one comparison, I forgot. So, blue one, ours, red one, uh, no noise correction. Essentially, the one that was implemented in the paper by the other guys with neural metrics. So, as you start increasing the noise, that estimate starts to get further and further away from the true one. And for 30% of the noise, the red one is there. Ours with the correction is on top of it still. I don't like that artifact on the right hand side, but that's what the algorithm does. So this is it. I mean, so the, the the major thing in here, the major message that I wanted to do in here is that if you're going to deal with noise, you might as well use the information you have, even if it's not complete information on the noise. Uh, so in our case, we assume we knew the distribution up to a bunch of parameters. You can then build all of those metrics that we've seen, trying to plot the, the, the or plot the minimum single value as a function of these parameters. Pick the lowest one, you should hit the parameter. Can be more than one parameter. You cannot do this with many parameters because you are searching a very non-convex, non-linear function. In some cases, you can put this as a polynomial optimization problem, but polynomial optimization problems are hard anyway. 
So uh, it's what it is. Um, we, this thing is very efficient. You do this computation of the structures of the matrix M as a function of your data and the theta, and you can store this in it with any theta. So if you fix your basis, you can compute the structure of this matrices M, store it somewhere, and then just use that to compute the matrix M linear time with respect to your data. So if you have millions of points, you can use millions of points. And uh, so you presented, so it's computationally efficient, and we've presented a few results on this That was it. So, oops. thank you.